and see things that generally, in my era, we tended to refrain from showing to anyone but our significant others. Um, it, it's, it's pretty shocking. And, and I don't think that people have that kind of informed consent at that age or even at our age as to what's happening. Target lost 140 million credit cards, email addresses, phone numbers, social insurance numbers, social security numbers, debit cards, debit card pins. Five years pr prior to that, there was a wonderful article in the New York Times talking about how Target was able to do demography in a wonderful way. So, so well, in fact, that they were able to inform, they sent pregnancy stuff to a family. Turned out the teenage girl was pregnant. And the father was outraged. He called up Target and said, how dare you send this stuff to my daughter? She's 15. She isn't pregnant. Well, she'd be buying certain supplements and certain looking at certain things at Target with her Target card, with her Target account. And sure enough, she was pregnant. And they were able to predict it. So sure, they've lost a few financial records. That's easy to turn around. Uh, and I'm sure Marcel's going to have a heart attack when, when I say that. But, but the actual deep information that they have is far scarier. Because it's stuff that is much more intimate than, than a little bit of personality theft. It, it, it could be life destructive. I've seen drug lists from uh, uh, Pfizer and others that have been stolen by individuals in this country. And you think about, well, what does that mean? Well, if you're on an HIV list, taking certain drugs, how that could destroy your life if that was made public. That's the kind of stuff that Big Dad is all about. We have for a very short. Yeah. I'll be brief. Uh, but basically, when you look at all the, the laws, and you look at all the, the information that people are making available, yeah, you know, and uh, we, uh, uh, one of the speakers mentioned it. So I think these days, you know, we need to really look at it, basically, be beyond the laws, what it means exactly in the new context, and how do we evolve with it? Because I think there's two things: is if somebody give away, you know, is is PI, that's one thing. And what company is doing with a lot of these information also is something else. And we need to, I would say, address both and probably we look at the definition of what it is exactly in this new context. Was the brief enough? <laughs> I'm not answering my email. I've got a timer going because we have a lot to get through. If I may summarize briefly, though, one of the issues that I hear being said here is that the key to privacy is that each individual own their own privacy. That when they use the internet, they treat it like they're using a car or anything else in life that there's responsibilities and, and consequences if you, if you don't take care. And so, uh, you know, and I got the comment back from some of the panelists that these questions are so, to have some overlap. Uh, there's no real taxonomy of privacy issues that makes any sense as far as I'm concerned. Um, so what can we do about it? If we recognize that there is an issue with personal information privacy, what can the average person do? I want to focus in not on the big technology solutions like internet, website, security, but more what can the individuals do and what technology exists that individual people can rely on? I don't think I don't think individuals understand what the nature of privacy is about. And I think that corporations and governments need to take the lead in terms of protecting people from themselves. Um, I, I no, actually if I was to trust every individual in this room, well, okay, you're all engineers and smart. I could still trick you. I could still get you to divulge your, your, your passwords and everything to me. I work in anti-phishing. I guarantee you, if you think you're smarter than me, then that makes you vulnerable. 
I, I think we need much better overarching protections for all of us. Because every, nobody, nobody will stand up and say, you know what, I'm the dumb guy that actually handed out my password. I've done it. You know, there's probably about a dozen other people in this room that have too. So my perspective is kind of slightly different. I think yeah, most people are aware of their privacy needs. Quite a few of them are not necessarily aware of the privacy concerns of doing certain things in the online world. And that's where the challenge comes in. The tools are there, and they have been there for quite a while. Uh, encrypted email, it's ex it exists. It's available to pretty much everybody. It provides you know, end to end security for the communication if you want to communicate with somebody very securely. Data encryption on, on laptops, on hard drives, it exists. It can be used to protect your data. Not putting potentially malicious software on your devices, it's a great idea. You know, it protects your data because there's nothing to take the data out of the device and see how it's fluctuated. Um, having said that, um, not too many people use this technology because A, it's not very convenient, and B, something you shouldn't actually pay for it. What's more convenient is using technologies such as you know, Facebook. You've got your contact list, you can very quickly send a message to somebody, you can share it with the world in hope that you know somebody is going to read it and you know, agree with it, and they'll think like you. But the truth is that the, the business model behind these services is fundamentally broken. The reason being is that you're not the customer of these services. The customer of these services are the people who are paying for advertising in these services. Google, Facebook, uh, Hotmail, they live, they make business case out of selling advertising. You are byproduct of that. The service is built to get your data, get your uh, information about your preferences, as well as you know, try to understand how to present the most effective ads to you. That's it. Right? It's designed for collection of information. So if you're expecting to have privacy within these services, whatever the service provider is telling you, they will not tell you the whole story because it conflicts with their business case. Um, one of the things that got condensed in my introduction is, uh, Gary didn't mention that I'm back at the University of Toronto doing a doctorate in, uh, basically my thesis is why privacy isn't being implemented. And you'd think I'd be sick of it after working my whole career watching how privacy isn't implemented because I've done pretty well every job in the spectrum. Um, but it is fascinating, and number one, people won't take these simple steps. They don't understand these, uh, these basic sort of principles that are behind these things. But they also don't complain. Not only do we have a system that is based on, quote, informed consent that isn't really working, but the privacy commissioners respond to complaints. And in the federal bill for the federal departments, you have to be the subject of the information to complain. If you, as a security expert, saw something that was just horrible happening in a department, you couldn't lodge a complaint on it because it's not your data, unless you like to put your data in there to get it lost. Um, on the other hand, in the, pri in the private sector bill, we made sure that anybody could complain so that we could avoid that. Because unfortunately, a lot of the complaints you do get are, well, in the banking business, it would be divorcing couples. You gave my personal information from my account to my ex-wife. Well, how is the poor clerk supposed to know that you're in the middle of a divorce, you know? Uh, we got quite a few of those. Those, you don't necessarily get the kinds of juicy policy issue complaints that you need to move the yardsticks. It takes people 10 years to, or 15 years to realize that the internet runs on advertising data and nothing comes for free. So when they realize this and start complaining, then maybe you can get some motion. And I'd just like to mention two complainers I admire greatly. I, I manned at a conference in U of T a couple of weeks ago a fellow who has taken on Facebook. Uh, his website is Europe v. Facebook, and if you Google it, you'll find him. His name is Max Schrempf. He's a student 
He sat in his living room with three fellow students and said, let's do something about this. They launched something like 40,000 complaints and access requests. <laughs> Believe me, that's a major headache. Uh, but they're getting somewhere. And similarly in Canada, we have our own, um, I'm going to forget his last name, Dick. Uh, he's a dentist. Spears. And he regularly complains. And his current complaint, which we're about to see launched, I think he would let me speak about it at this conference, uh, is on the um, Aeroplan card. One of the major companies has, has shifted. And he's quit his car, they don't own them anymore, but he cannot stop his data being transferred to the new owner of that particular program. Well, that proves who controls the data and what he signed on to when he signed on to a, a banking card that gave him points. But you, you have to see this thing starkly like that. I mean, you absolutely, you, you know, you complain, you say, give me back my data, you do everything. We'll see, he'll probably lose when he takes it to the privacy commissioner uh, because he signed an agreement that said basically they own that data. And long after the relationship's over, they still own the profile they have of him. I think that, that's fine. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, basically, and from uh, the technology uh, side, I think we need to, to, to really look at it. Yes. Adding the, the user has also the, I would say, authority uh, in order to move it forward. I think there's not enough complaints for, for sure, but at the beginning, you know, you can stop doing things on, and uh, maybe I may have a question here, you know, it's, it's like running a car, you know, we don't give a car to, you know, uh, somebody under 16. But how many of you have given access to internet, you know, you know, you know to four or five year old uh, kids? Uh, how many, you know, you have been allowed to use uh, Facebook, basically? And, you know, how many of you have proudly provided the proper I was information to your kids. So that start really there. So if they're not conscious, you know, I think human being we like to trust others. So we're trusting a lot of people. And uh, but uh, you know it's a, we, we have certain me I would say underlying question there that we need to ask ourselves on how to uh, to what what to do with it. So I think it's a complex situation because it's not you know, a tool that will do a lot of things because tool does exist. I think it's when we deal with information, it's like with people. <coughs> you know, we were talking about uh, legislation laws. I think that we protect some of the aspects of the use of internet. But, uh, for instance, uh, how can you regulate internet behavior? It's impossible. Whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, you're using internet for different aspects of your life. And uh, it's available, and you're yeah, glad it's, it's available. But uh, the problem is that uh, within uh, the internet society, we went to a survey in 30 different countries. So the legal framework in each of the country has been giving a different definition of information privacy at different levels. So there's a, a regulatory gap over the planet on, on uh, pri information privacy. And in, in, in no way uh, you will be able to stop statistical uh, uh, profiling. It's, it's done, it's being done. So is there any technology that could stop that? I, I just want to say one thing. Um, as long as we're talking about statistical profiling or data analytics or big data or data mining, this to me is the issue of the future. I mean, the reason why human rights advocates care about privacy is because it is the cornerstone of a whole nest of other human rights. It's, it's how you prevent discrimination. It's how you ensure democratic 
rights, freedom of speech, freedom of, of assembly, they all depend on privacy. And if you let that go because it's just too hard to manage big data, then you have let democracy go. I hope I'm not being hyperbolic here, but uh, I've got plenty of support in that. Um, there are lots of ex-privacy commissioners and ex and retired privacy scholars working at big data right now. There are no easy answers. Oscar Gandy first wrote about big data way back in the panoptic sort back in the 90s. He just retired from Annenberg and wrote another book, Coming to Terms with Chance. And what he says, and he spent most of his career studying discrimination against blacks in the United States, despite the anti-discrimination laws, there's plenty of ways to get around it with information. So he had given up on privacy law to protect people against big data. He thinks what you need is something like a, an environmental protection agency. So when someone is discriminated against, just like when someone's poisoned, they start looking upstream to see who did it. Uh, because if anybody thinks, the problem with big data is a lot of it's wrong. And even if you lead a sainted life, that doesn't mean you're not going to be discriminated against. So a lot of people smugly think, oh, this isn't going to happen to me, particularly the elites. They just don't understand. So, sorry. Yeah, of course. That's fine. Uh, we seem to have segued rather well into the next question, which is really related to, and it's a bit redundant, but it's more, how do you protect the average person globally? I want to rephrase the question just a little bit um, because this really was the intent originally. Is that if you, and there's been a lot of discussion here, I know in the UNICEF talk, there was talk about using SMS for children to, to ask questions about health and so forth. So, how do you protect people who don't necessarily have a big corporate entity that you can point your finger at or say this is your responsibility? The people who don't necessarily have access to uh, the, the technology of the ISP or an ISP that they, have, they can rely on. I would like to, to give two examples that uh, when I was working for the Quebec government, for instance, we've been uh, launching in 2004 uh, the Service Québécois de Changement d'Adresse, changing address service, encrypted. For various reasons, many departments are asking for your new address when you're moving. And for various reasons, you don't want anybody else to know that you've been moving. It's been discussed here, right? So this is a, a neat service to really protect uh, uh, people who have been suffering violence, uh, the wars, and that kind of issue. And the information is, is shared among the departments anonymously, and it answers to 80% of the job that as a citizen I have to do within the government to let them know that I moved. And other services when you are doing business with the government, there's a quick secure technology that's available to all citizens. I don't want to enter into details, but I, I mean, it's, it's a free phase one. You can use that kind of tool to protect yourself, protect your data. And there's also other simple services that are available on your computer and that you don't use. Many of the internauts, they don't simply use that. Confidentiality, uh, privacy, it's available in, on, on your browser. At least, I don't say that it's a perfect solution, technical solution, but it's a good start. Now, we need some education to let everybody know how to use that because it's not natural for people, especially the ones that are not uh, internet born, to you know, uh, discover those things. They, they're just using the internet, period, that's all they want. But they can protect an awful lot of data that they are uh, sharing uh, on the net. And what if I want to protect my data from the government? Uh, oh, okay. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a vote going on in Syria right now. And there are Montreal Syrians who are actually quite angry because they can't vote. And they went, you know, they, they make pro protests to uh, various media and stuff, coming out pro-Assad. 
And that puts them in danger, just as those people who define themselves as NPSF. Um, what if I don't want my government to know where I live? I have that right. Yes. And, except I don't. Because if I want medical, if I want to drive a car, if I want services, there's an exchange. And then once I give it to one, it gives it to all. Um, It's complicated, it's so very complicated these days because I remember implementing Stephanie's uh, work. When I, worked at Con when, when, when I worked at Concordia, um, we were told to put locks on filing cabinets. That was the implementation of Pivota in the 90s, is making sure that the personnel files and the student records had a padlock on them. And you know what? That was a hell of a lot more effective than any kind of thing. You know, uh, my friend Matt here said said something about the technologies exist, and I will say to you, heart bleed. We thought the technologies existed, and oops, 500 of the top firms and banks and everything in the world were giving away everybody's data. Yahoo had to pull an emergence, and had to pull a fire alarm <coughs> of epic proportions to stop all of their passwords being handed out. The technology, as far as I'm concerned, falls short. Legislation falls short. Everything falls short. But what I think we're all agreeing is, is a tsunami of a problem that is on the horizon. And I don't have an answer. I do have an awful lot of fear about 10 years from now what all that data is going to mean to somebody. And, and it may not be a nice man. It may be an assassin. It may be a dictator. It may be any number of nightmares, uh, 